living a life of God worship and follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at meal times or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never print or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Please stand for our hymn. The title, A Grateful Heart, is in the insert in your book of this week. money away 
away. So he started um, a company, and I've lost my place. <laughs> I don't want you to miss any of this story. So he evidently pioneered the idea of giving while living, spending most of your fortune on big hands-on charity bets instead of funding a foundation upon death. Since you can't take your money with you, I hope that's not a surprise out here, <laughs> he suggested give it all away before you die. And um, this way you can control where it goes and you can see the fruits of your labor with your own eyes. According to an article by Stephen Vitroni in Forbes magazine, over the last four decades, Feeney has donated more than $8 billion to charity. Universities and foundations worldwide through his foundation, the Atlantic Philanthropies. When Bertrani first met Feeney in 2012, he estimated that he had set aside $2 million for his wife and his retirement. So in other words, he has given away $375,000 more money than his current net worth. Did you get that? 375,000% more than his net worth. As he gave it away um, anonymously also, and because of his clandestine globe-trotting philanthropy campaign, Forbes called him the James Bond of philanthropy. Bertani says, the man who amassed a fortune selling luxury goods to tourists and later launched private equity powerhouse General Atlantic lives in an apartment in San Francisco that has the austerity of a freshman dorm room. When he visited a few years ago, Ink Jeff printed photos of friends and family hung from his walls over a plain wooden table. And on the table sat a lucite plaque, plaque that read, Congratulations to Chuck Feeney for $8 billion of philanthropic giving. Feeney's generosity encouraged Warren Buffett and Bill Gates to make a giving pledge in 2010. Chuck was a cornerstone in terms of inspiration for the giving pledge, says Warren Buffett. He's a model for us all. It's going to take me 12 years after my death to get done what he's doing in his lifetime. To give away this money, they started a company called Atlantic Philanthropy. The company had 300 plus employees, 10 global offices across seven time zones. The specific closure date was set years ago as part of his long-term plan to make high-risk high impact donations by setting a hard deadline to give away all his money and close shop. The 2020 expiration date added urgency and discipline. It gave the Atlantic Philanthropies the time to document its history, reflect on wins and losses, and create a strategy that other institutions could follow. As Feeney told me in 2019, our giving is based on the opportunities, 
not a plan to stay in business for a long time. In September 14, 2020, Feeney and his wife completed their four-decade mission and signed the documents to close the company. So where did the $8 billion go? Feeney gave $3.7 billion to education, including $1 billion to his alma mater, Cornell, which interestingly enough, he attended on the GI Bill. More than $870 million went to human rights and social change. $62 million went to grants to abolish the death penalty in the U.S. And $76 million for grassroots campaigns supporting the passage of Obamacare. He gave more than $700 million in gifts to health ranging from a $270 million grant to improve public health care in Vietnam and to a $176 million gift to the Global Brain Health Institute, a partnership program between Trinity College Dublin and the University of California in San Francisco. In one of Feeney's final gifts, $350 million went to Cornell to build a technology campus on New York City's Roosevelt Island. While notoriously frugal in his own life, Feeney was ready to spend big and go for broke when the value and potential impact outweighed the risk. Wow. But being generous is not about the size of our bank account, but it's about our willingness to give. Mother Teresa told a wonderful story about generosity. Mother Teresa went to visit a Hindu family who hadn't eaten in days, and she brought them some rice. The mother immediately divided the rice in half and took half of it next door to her Hindu neighbors. I mean, her Muslim neighbors. She was Hindu and she took it to her Muslim family. And Mother Teresa said to her, I didn't give you enough rice to feed the 10 people in your house. How could you possibly share half of it with your neighbor? And the woman said, but they haven't eaten either. This woman showed great generosity. Generosity isn't about the size of our bank account, but it's about the size of our heart. Thanksgiving is more than just a day on a calendar. It is meant to be a Christian lifestyle. It is learning to see the world with God's eyes. Jesus said, steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Christian stewardship is not only about money, though. It's also about how we treat the world's resources. How do we treat our oceans? How do we treat our land? How do we treat the rest of God's creation? Christine Sign, on her website, godspacelight.com, recently had an article entitled, Imagine a World of Beauty and Goodness and Wonder. 
and she wrote this. In a book, A New Heaven and a New Earth by Richard Middleton, he suggests that human stewardship was supposed to transform the whole earth into a fitting place not just for humankind to dwell, but also for God to dwell. I've never heard that distinction before, so let me repeat that. Human stewardship was supposed to transform the whole earth into a fitting place, not just for humankind to dwell, but also for God to dwell. Can you imagine it? God longs for a beautiful place in which to dwell and walk once more with humankind. To me, that is absolutely incredible. Even more incredible is the coming of Jesus into the world to make this happen. Sign invites the readers to imagine the world as the world you want to live in. What do you value in this world? How do people treat each other? Can you hear the laughter and the joy? Can you imagine the delight as people share and care for each other? In this world, how do you think people treat God's creation? And as a result, how does it feel and look? Memorize your images of this world and imagine Jesus being born into our broken and ravaged world and walking beside each of us, encouraging us to bring this new world into being. You know, she got me thinking, when I want to walk through some of the neighborhoods of the world with Jesus by my side, or would I be embarrassed? And I'm afraid there are some places I would be embarrassed to take Jesus to, because they're just not what God intended. I really think there's a wonderful word here. So today is Stewardship Sunday, when we ask you to make a financial pledge to do something for God's kingdom. One way is to support this church. She continues to find ways to make a meaningful difference in our community. Through making free meals for people who are food insecure, for collecting for our local food bank, for collecting diapers for children in the Trenton area. And soon we're going to be offering our Advent soup lunch devotion and providing a free lunch um, for those who cannot pay. And of course we meet weekly to worship God. So if you would like to support us by helping to keep the building open, that would be great. Because one of the things the church building does, in addition to allowing us to worship, is it actually gives us a place to work from and to take things out into the community. It would be hard to deliver meals if we had no place to make meals, for example. But if this ministry doesn't speak to you, I want you to know that's okay too. Just find something that does speak to you. That is a way for you to give thanks to God for the blessings in God's world and in your life. And as you go through this week, imagine the world you want to live in and ask yourself, 
Is there one way I can help transform the world? Amen. I have two additional prayer requests this day. One is for Fran Wong, and one is for Pastor Russ's daughter, Megan. And the prayer that I'm using, I adapted from a prayer written by Jock Stein. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for everything we delight in. Sunlight in autumn days, color in nature and art, rhythm in poetry and music, human achievement and family success, good humor, work well done, love and friendship, and all your gifts to body and soul. Most of all, we delight in your salvation, the knowledge of your love, the assurance of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We commend to you those who work in harsh conditions and those who have no work, those whose lives are drab and gray, those whose poor health takes away the delight in living, those who are on our prayer list, including Fran and Megan, those who are lonely, those who have no home of their own. Grant them the human help and comfort which they need and the spiritual encouragement which will enable them to live with hope and courage for the sake of Jesus Christ, who leads us to salvation. We pray for older, adult, older adults, asking for them clear faith and human support. We pray for those in middle years, asking for them wisdom in their choices and recovery of a sense of wonder. We pray for the young, asking for them good opportunities and that their ambitions include the desire to serve. We pray for our nation, that we may hear Jesus' call to be peacemakers, and that we allow you to be born in it this day. May we all continue to seek the God of every age, may known in Jesus Christ, the greatest friend of all. We bless you, God, space maker, cloud rider, earth lover. We bless you for this great company of saints who have gone before us and now delight in your presence. With them, we honor and praise your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as they were taught to pray, so do we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 